And so as a young progressive student, my main agenda was how the hell does a progressive young person who wants to do research and understand stuff and, and influence the public debate deal with what we're facing? You've got the whole academy in economics twisting the argument that you've got to have unemployment, abandoning the whole concept of a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. My ideological persuasion was that capitalism was conflictual and also my Keynesian influence was that it was prone to underemployment, but also as the social democratic era evolved, it was also prone to inflationary biases. I wanted desperately to work out a way, a plan that would cut through that accepted wisdom and come up with an alternative that was progressive. And the progressiveness was that you didn't create unemployment, that you gave people jobs. And any other plans that, like UBI and basic income that you want to propose can't address that conflict without unemployment. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard MMT co-founder Professor Bill Mitchell, and in a moment we're going to be hearing Bill, along with Professor Pavlina Chernova, in conversation with Anne Maxwell, Jane Flanagan, and Marcus Champ of Modern Money Australia at an online event which took place on the 26th of February 2021. In the show notes, I've linked to where you can support Modern Money Australia financially, and their website is also where you can find video of this event and where you can sign up for email alerts about their upcoming events, which are not to be missed because they've got some great speakers coming up. So be sure to check that out. A central theme of the conversation you're about to hear is the MMT job guarantee. And if you're familiar with MMT, you'll know that the government is the monopoly issuer of the currency you use if you live in a country with a monetarily sovereign government, like, say, the UK, the US, Japan, Canada or Australia. Governments like these issue new money when they spend rather than recycling previously collected tax money. And taxes in countries like these serve primarily to create a demand for the currency among its users. That's you and me, the private sector. And then after that, taxes serve to control the level of spending power in the private sector as a whole, and also to incentivize and disincentivize certain types of economic activity. And you can listen to our first three episodes if you want an introduction to how all of that works. The good news is that your government, when it's acting rationally and functioning properly, usually spends more than it taxes back over a given period of time. And that money left over after we've all paid our dollars or pounds or yen back to the government is our spending money. And we, the private sector, get to spend that money on whatever we want on consumption or investment or maybe building a business of our own. But the bad news is that that number of pounds or dollars or yen circulating in the economy, changing hands for these goods and services is called the government deficit. And it would seem the most hated word in all the land is deficit. And the second most hated word in all the land is government. And it would seem that it's the work of politicians to blame everything bad in the universe ever on the existence of a government deficit. And it's the work of the rest of us who want rational economic policy to remind people of the elementary truth that every deficit is balanced by a corresponding surplus and that the government's deficit must be equal to the non-government surplus. In other words, it's our money. And arguing for government deficit reduction amounts to arguing for austerity. MMT economists suggest that instead of targeting an arbitrary deficit figure and letting the chips or the hungry schoolchildren fall where they may, we should target, oh, I don't know, a good economy and let the deficit, which is a number on a spreadsheet at a central bank, be what it needs to be to achieve that. 
Some may argue that a good economy is one where they live in a castle and the rest of us gather on select occasions to cheer them on. But if you're not Bono and you understand that the government is the issuer of the thing that we all need to acquire to feed ourselves and put a roof over our heads, it becomes clear that unemployment and poverty are the result of the issuer of currency not maintaining enough spending power in the economy to give everybody a job. It's the evidence of government underspending or overtaxing, and the challenge then becomes how to increase the private sector's surplus, aka the government deficit, in a way that gives everybody a job but doesn't cause a damaging acceleration in inflation. The MMT solution is for the government to have a buffer stock of jobs and to guarantee one to anyone who is willing and able to work at a fixed, socially inclusive wage and for this pool of job guarantee labour to expand and contract with the business cycle to ensure that no one suffers due to a lack of currency ever again. We've made a few episodes about the finer points of the job guarantee and I've linked to those in the show notes and to some other great resources, chief among them Professor Cheneva's excellent job guarantee FAQ page and of course her book The Case for a Job Guarantee. I've also linked to a list of political initiatives worldwide that are advocating for a job guarantee if you'd like to get involved. Three things to bear in mind if you're new to the idea of a job guarantee – one, it's voluntary. It's a guaranteed offer of work rather than a demand to work. It's there to solve involuntary unemployment for people who want a job but can't yet find one. You could still be voluntarily unemployed under this scheme. It would be an extra option to what we have now. Two, the job guarantee is not designed to replace financial support for those who can't or shouldn't work. For instance, disabled people. And of course, if you have an understanding of where money comes from and that poverty and unemployment are the consequences of the government maintaining too little spending power in the economy, it becomes clear that support payments to people who can't work could and should be paid at a much higher level than they are now in most so-called advanced economies. Three, the job guarantee wage becomes the de facto minimum wage and any other conditions you put into the job guarantee become the national minimum standards. So if you are an advocate of, say, a four hour work week, the way to make sure everybody has that is to make sure that the job guarantee job is a four hour work week paid at a socially inclusive wage. If you can't get behind that, probably what you're advocating for is a four hour work week for you and not everybody else. Not that that's a good or a bad thing, but just to emphasize the way our money system works right now means that whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, the currency issuer, the government does set the minimum pay and conditions for all workers in our respective economies. And the way we do things right now, the minimum pay is zero and the minimum conditions are you're dead. So call me a utopian, but I think we can do better couple more points before we dive in. You'll hear Pavlina talk about the Nairu. For first-time listeners, that's the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, which is the technical term used to justify the trade-off between inflation and human life. And I've linked to a quick overview of the MMT counter acronym, the NIBUR, the non-accelerating buffer employment ratio, should you need some ammunition with which to outwonk the wonks. And most importantly, Professor Bill Mitchell is running an online MMT course, which is underway at the moment. It looks to me like you can still join right up until the end of March, but I'd say the sooner you join, the better, because new content is added every Wednesday until the course finishes. And speaking from experience, it's a great course. It's free to all, or if you want to earn a certification, it's very, very inexpensive. So I've linked to where you can sign up for that in the show notes. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month, which is 72 British pence at the time of recording. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We are 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff 
really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT and huge thanks to Jane, Anne, Marcus and the rest of the Modern Money Australia team for organising this event. We start with opening remarks from Anne. Let's dive in. My name is Anne Maxwell and I am part of the committee with Modern Money Australia who are hosting today's event which is a webinar featuring Professor Bill Mitchell and Associate Professor Pavlina Cheneva. And to start with, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land where I am today, which is the lands of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respect to the elders, past and present. Myself and Marcus Champ, who is also with Modern Money Australia. Marcus will be moderating most of the Q&A today and I'll be assisting him. Thank you. Well, at this point, I might hand over to Jane, who did a lot of work to put this event together today, and she'll make some introductory remarks. Hi, everyone. So I'm Jane Flanagan, and I'm currently um, president of our little association, which is incorporated, and we came into existence about 18 months ago. Modern Money Australia, We our main purpose is to um, provide sort of an ind independent media, I suppose, education about modern monetary theory. We are a group of volunteers and are working unpaid to um, bring you these uh, events. We have received significant donations that have contributed towards our subscription to Zoom for the next two webinars. And so we um, really appreciate people who have donated. And if you are able to um, donate for future events, um, we can then cover the, the minimal costs, which are Zoom costs mostly. Um, so we can continue to provide these um, webinars. In terms of this today's webinar, I took inspiration from the second chapter of Pavlina's book. I went into a little bit of a rabbit hole around the social contract, social contract theory and MMT, really. First of all, I wanted to put it in perspective in terms of what we've all been experiencing over the last year. Today, the United States has reached a devastating COVID-19 toll with um, 508,000 deaths, with a total number of cases reaching 28.4 million. So to put that in perspective, this was heard on the radio the other day, there have been more US citizens die from COVID-19 in the last year than died in World War I, World War II and Vietnam War combined. And deaths in the US <clears throat> account for approximately 20% of the total number of deaths worldwide. The total worldwide stands at 2.5 million deaths. And the total number of cases is now at 113 million with um, approximately 380,000 new cases in the world every day. Reminding people of where we're at, because in Australia we have had nearly a month, in New South Wales at least, the longest duration without community transmission since the beginning of the pandemic. And so we kind of feel a little bit removed from the nightmare that people are living in other countries, but we feel a sense of solidarity, I suppose, especially across um, the MMT community, particularly because we understand that it could have been avoided, it could have been totally avoided, this catastrophe. The figures really do sort of illustrate how we're not in this together and how the politics of, our, um, of the pandemic has divided us across national boundaries and across regional boundaries, across, you know, between individuals that, that has divided us. In Australia, um, our figures are minuscule in comparison. So we have had only 909 deaths. We've done magnitudes better than, for example, the US, the UK and Europe. The lesson also here is that we can't get caught in the intellect intellectual trap of anchoring against the extreme and horrific figures that we see in the US and letting it corrupt our reasoning and um, stop us from understanding that we could have prevented even what number of cases that we've had in Australia because we could quite frankly have done better in Australia and we could have achieved zero, zero COVID a year ago. We could have achieved zero COVID in all of the countries a year ago. Something I read, um, a tweet by Bill Bartel, who's quite a prominent figure in public health in Australia, who said, 
that nature creates viruses, bad politicians, or more so bad politics create pandemics. In terms of the social contract, I wanted to say really that we've sort of suffered under another sort of virulent strain, a plague called neoliberalism, and it really has um, skewed our social contract in favour of a very small minority. And they've really captured our democracy and in the process also have duped us, a lot of us, into a bogus sort of sense of liberty and freedom where we um, are more focused on sort of the freedom from government in our lives and really have sort of missed the bigger problem of being free from the market, which has really intervened in um, a lot of aspects of our policy and caused significant problems. MMT really does clarify who holds genuine power or sovereignty within our society. And at the moment, the people that hold the, the genuine power and who have the ability or using the money system to serve their interests are really the market. In educating people about modern monetary theory, we're educating them to really have that sense that we need to reclaim, as Bill Woods has said, production of the, the currency. I'll hand it over now to Bill. Well, uh, thanks very much, Jane, and thanks to Anne and Marcus and, and all the team at MMA. It's uh, fantastic to see you again, Pavlina. Yeah, I mean, this is a really vexed issue. And um, I grew up in post-war Australia at a time when, in material terms, we were considerably less well-off than we are now. We had a growing economy, but it was a fairly primitive economy. We were exporting commodities, primary commodities, and we had a burgeoning manufacturing sector protected by tariff walls. But what we did have, and, and you know, I mean, I, 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 people often criticise that era, and there's a lot to criticise in terms of our approach to our Indigenous Australians, our approach, male approach to women, the cons, you know, the exclusion of women from a lot of things, and they they were things that over time have evolved a bit, and they're still not satisfactory. But uh, what we did have in that era was a concept of collective will and uh, a, a concept of society and a concept of each one of us being a member of that society and giving to it. And uh, you, you grew up in that society realising that you expected something from it and if it didn't come from the kindness of your neighbours or your parents, then it came from the state. And, uh, and I personally benefited significantly growing up in a very low-income working-class family um, from state welfare. Uh, and that state welfare included both trans cash transfers and all sorts of things like that, scholarships and help in, in cash terms, but also it was crucial that the, and, I, and that was the men in those days because of the sort of stratification of the labour market, it, the, it was crucial that the men could have work and the poorest men, the lowest income men, and a lot of these men were people who'd come back from the Second World War, uh, who'd grown up and survived the Great Depression and came back from the Second World War with nothing. Uh, they'd just gone to war on a dream, you know, of, of serving their nation and what all those sort of sentiments uh, uh, we can contest those sentiments and I, I have all my life about the, you know, the emphasis on celebrating war and all of that. But those men would, did what they thought was best and they came back with nothing, a lot of them, and the, uh, the unskilled men in the context of labour market skills. And uh, the state looked after them through making sure that the state used its policy power, its capacity, to ensure there was always jobs. Now, there weren't always jobs in the private sector, 
or in the career public sector. But there was another sector in the Australian economy which was replicated in almost every other economy in this period, and that was, you could conceive it as a job guarantee sector. It wasn't called that then, but you could always get a job on any day of the week during this period by going to the, the railway yards, the ports, the local government uh, depots. Uh, you could get jobs in, in, in the housing utilities that were within government, not privatised, within the transport utilities. And that was the difference between full employment and not. It wasn't that everybody had jobs in uh, the other sectors. It was because there was a buffer stock and absorption sector that meant that for whatever reason you didn't have an income, you could get a job. And with the events of the 70s and the, and the shift in mentality, as we started to lose our sense of, and it wasn't that it just happened by accident. We were, the, the narrative changed as, you know, for people who, who are old enough will remember all the debates in the early 70s about profit squeeze and, um, you know, in America there was the power mem memorandum which really lay the blueprint for, for, for what was to come, how, how capital was going to come back. And um, that changed the narrative. And the big difference now between now and then was that we had collective will then. We thought as a collective and we've been now manipulated to think as individuals and a lot of our thinking about public policy and how we understand the logic of government, et cetera, is because we, we think as individuals now and we somehow have been, been duped into believing that if we just look after ourselves and uh, uh, it'll all be okay. And, and this concept of society has lapsed a bit. Now, what the pandemic taught us in Australia is that there still is a very much a, a, a society and, and what was heartening in a, in a travesty for me was what, what gave me some hope in the last year was that the embers of society, the embers of collective will are still there. It was quite clear that we adopted in this country a very explicit uh, pressure on governments that we weren't going to let our parents and our grandparents die, that we were going to protect everybody no matter what. Now, there were lapses because of quarantine leaks, but not many. And we as a society stood by our state governments, even though the neoliberal federal government was berating them to uh, open borders and do all that sort of stuff and open shops and the business communities were, the people of Australia stood by, forced our state governments, and this was a peculiarity of our constitution, which we all now understand that the federal government isn't in necessarily in charge of a whole lot of things. So these are uh, things that we hadn't actually thought about unless you're a constitutional lawyer came to came to fruition that the state governments had a lot of power that they did that we didn't think they had. But we forced our state governments to, uh, look after all of us. And uh, we were prepared to, you know, Melbourne, 111 days of lockdown, no, not moving five kilometres from your house only once a day. Unbelievable. And, and so that, that's, that's why we're in the state we are. But that taught me that the, the, the idea of collective will hasn't been eliminated from our psyche, our, our, the way we think about each other and the way we think about the responsibilities of government. Now, to talk more explicitly about employment guarantees, there's a lot of noise out there all the time about this, and I'll summarise the points very quickly because we all want to hear from Pavlina. And uh, the points are this that when I came up with the idea of the job guarantee in 1978, uh, the buffer stock mechanism, I was a young student 
and, and going into postgraduate studies. And the big issue of the day was inflation. Australia had inflation up around 19%. And it was, that came from the oil shocks and the massive increase in the price of oil and all these our oil-dependent nations suffered massive price shocks. And if you were alive then, you'll know that the very next council throwout, there were all these big tanks and out on the nature strips and they were oil heaters. People would get, they couldn't afford to heat their homes anymore. And, and there was a dramatic substitution to gas and small cars and all the rest of it, but that took time. So th the era that I grew up in was the beginning of monetarism as a student was and, and as a postgraduate student. The beginning of, uh, at that time was high inflation and the academy had been taken over by monetarists. The, 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 all the Keynesians had disappeared and the monetarists were ruling the roost. So, I mean, I, I started, I was in universities where monetarism was rife and their, their construction of the inflation problem was it was excessive deficits, was it was too much money and uh, the government had to run, uh, go quickly as possible into surplus and cut the public sector dramatically and, of course, you know, in the, light, uh, in the light of increased knowledge, we know that that was a political strategy, an ideological strategy, because the, the, uh, the principles of monetarism don't stack up in any knowledge sense. It was an ideological agenda, uh, even if some of the adherents and proponents didn't appreciate that and they were just being used as well. But the point is that this was an era where unemployment had previously been less than 2% for four decades nearly, three and a half decades. And governments in Australia lost federal elections if unemployment went above 2%. And suddenly in this late 70s, we're having unemployment rising to 3%, 4%, 5%, and then it, it, it never went back down. And so as a young progressive student, wanting to build a postgraduate career and is wanting to then go on and try to become an academic. My main agenda was how the hell am I going, how the hell does a progressive young person who wants to do research and, and understand stuff and, and influence the public debate through research, how the hell does that person deal with what we're facing. You've got the whole academy in economics twisting the argument that you've got to have unemployment, abandoning the whole concept of a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. And because a lot of my early reading and study had been in with Kolesky and Marx and, and those great classical uh, economists, I also came my ideological persuasion was that capitalism was conflictual and that one of the it was prone to and also my Keynesian thinking influence was that it was prone to underemployment and steady states and with high unemployment but also as the social democratic era evolved it was also prone to inflationary biases because of the distributional struggles, the conflict over the distribution of income. And that was because you had two big price setting powers in the labour market, the unions and the, and the more concentrated firms that could battle it out through price adjustments and wage demands. And so as a young, acad young aspiring academic who wanted a research career, I wanted desperately to work out a way that I could come up with a plan that would uh, uh, cut through that accepted wisdom and come up with an alternative that was progressive. And the progressiveness was that you didn't create unemployment, that you gave people jobs. And it came out of my studies as people will, who've read my work in agricultural economics, where Australia was successfully more or less at the time running a wool price stabilisation scheme. And that, that was a price stability scheme that gave sheep farmers full employment effectively of their clip and that's where job guarantee came from it's an anti-inflation device that 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 uh, uh, 
prevents society from building unemployment and instead offers people jobs for the for the time that's needed to mediate and 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 cut back into that conflictual uh, distributional conflict and attenuate the inflationary pressures i never saw it as a job creation scheme i never saw it as a as as a very nice scheme i never saw it as something we should aspire to i just saw it as being a whole lot better than than the travesty of unemployment and it, and it gave us some room to breathe without creating that unemployment. And then as I studied a little bit more, and I'll be another minute, as I studied more, I realised that that buffer stock of jobs also was, were really, that, that it existed in the post-war period, were really permanent jobs for some people. Some people that had mental mental illnesses, episodic illnesses, people who were in and out of the prison criminal justice system, uh, young students, young musicians, young artists, a whole range of people used that buffer stock capacity to their own advantage to get give them income and give them a chance to participate and contribute where they couldn't get th that opportunity in the standard employment sector. So I realised that it couldn't just be a temporary anti-inflation buffer. It had to be a permanent system we, and we should aspire to make that as small as possible at all times. Now, in a non-inflationary period like we've got now, the job guarantee wouldn't be the first priority of government. The, the job guarantee should be there as a piece of institutional mechanics that the system has always but the aims of government should always be to minimise it by creating high paid, high productivity, secure, dignified, decent jobs. That's not to say that job guarantee jobs would be undignified, but the infl anti-inflationary capacity of the scheme has to be that they are at the bottom of the wage distribution and fixed price. That's, that's the realities of that. And as a society, we shouldn't aspire to to relying on that type of structure for advance of well-being, but it's an essential piece of the machinery in a capitalist system that's conflictual. And any other plans that, like UBI and basic income that you want to propose can't address that conflict without unemployment unless you have a buffer stock of jobs. So I'll leave it there, but that's 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 the sort of context in which this, which I came up with this proposal, and later when I ran into met met up with Warren, which has been a really rewarding uh, relationship for me personally, and uh, I hope others. Uh, he he came from it in a in a different way, but ex exactly the same sort of sentiment that it was to be minimised, it was an essential piece of inf institutional economic policy structure, but it should be minimised. And it can be minimised in a non-inflationary environment by government creating high quality jobs. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill. So I'll hand over to Pavlina and I really, I suppose, have been um, very interested in the, how Pavlina talks about the um, unemployment crisis as a silent epidemic and some of the MMT-informed policies really being about prevention and preparedness. And it is, I think, pertinent that this was being, you've been writing about this prior to the pandemic. And so that language we are all familiar with now, but in, um, in terms of um, what's happening in society at the moment, when we look at the, a lot of the um, problems of inequality and problems of associated with the wicked problems of public health, the causes of the causes of the causes. We need to look really deep into what the root of those causes are. And I have to say, doing a master's of public health, I think they always neglect to look at the macro and how the scarcity economics is hamstringing our public policy. So I am interested in you speaking about that and um, considering how Bill has discussed the um, small part that a job guarantee would play in terms of the labour market policy and addressing these issues or the issues of capitalism, inherent to capitalism. Acknowledging that, would you say that the job guarantee, the um, power of the job guarantee to transform 
the prevailing neoliberal contract is in its function as an automatic stabiliser and a price anchor. And what would you, would a new social contract founded on this new macroeconomic model, how would that look for workers? A lot to work with there, but um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you. No, thank you, Jane. And thank you to Anne and Marcus for inviting me. And it's always a pleasure to be with Bill. I was just thinking that maybe the last, and I'm going to date myself, but I think the last time I was in Australia was maybe about 20 years ago, or maybe 19, when uh, Bill was organizing uh, the coffee conferences. So I think I'm long overdue for a visit, hopefully soon. Um, so thank you for bringing the public health um, angle, because you know when I was reading Bill's work on the buffer stock that people are now familiar with, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, struck me and everyone that reads that narrative is that how we have wonderfully managed to figure out a price stabilization scheme for wool and for other commodities. And there are other examples where we could, you know, just stabilize the price of corn and soybeans and gold. We sell them and we buy them. Um, but you know, to be able to stabilize the price of a commodity, you actually have to employ the commodity. You can't just fix the price. You have to also have an employment program. So it got me thinking, you know, that Bill's argument um, that we are not doing that for labor is, you know, probably the most egregious kind of example of us having a perfectly good policy, but not applying it to the most valuable resource that we have. And so, you know, often people talk about let's increase the minimum wage is very important. Of course, uh, it's critical to increase the minimum wage, but that is not a complete policy. You also have to have an employer at that minimum wage policy of last resort to ensure that anyone can find that employment opportunity. So, you know, when you think about it, wool doesn't care if it's employed or not right? Wool can, you know, go and rot and go and sold and corn can waste away. And all of these commodities, they don't care if gold is buried in the ground, but people care. People experience the mental, physical, all the other costs that come with unemployment, which makes this macroeconomic paradigm even more pernicious. We have tools, we're not deploying them, and we are willingly um, bearing these social and economic costs. So what I do in my work is that I connect the macroeconomic features of the program with the um, public health findings. And there are many, you know, the literature on public health is not new, but it really has not been brought into the macro framework that um, the costs of unemployment are there are many and they're mostly non-monetary, okay? And um, so when you think about, you know, BI or UBI programs, like they will not be, you know, a solution to the problem of unemployment. <clears throat> but also for the very reasons that you mentioned, Jane, in the introduction, you know, I, I look at unemployment, not just as a macro phenomena that goes up and down throughout time, but I also look at it spatially. Very often in my presentations, I show a map of unemployment, how unemployment behaves in a geographical sense. It really ripples through a community and very much mimics the behavior of viruses and epidemics. And so that that metaphor that you know I, I, I came up with before the pandemic wasn't really a metaphor. It was a description of the way unemployment actually dissipates through a community. And so when you start thinking about the social costs, the mechanism through which unemployment ripples through, um, and the fact that this is a um, highly destabilizing process, right? An economy that tolerates mass unemployment is much more unstable than one that aims at full employment. Um, then you start thinking about different policy responses from the outset. And in macro, we usually respond too little too late, as you know, we see the crisis that's upon us, and then we try to tackle it, and of course, it never works. But when you connect the, the employment program with this 
epidemiologic, epidemiological view, you actually start thinking about preparedness. You start thinking about prevention. You start thinking about putting in place structures that are permanent, that exist on an ongoing basis, that tackle the problem of unemployment and thus prevent all of the other macroeconomic, social, political, you name it, costs. So these are the two pieces that you know, I think are probably worth um, uh, highlighting that just like Bill is saying, we're not just talking just another job. That's not really what we're talking about. We are talking about just deeper structural changes in the way the economy is working and in a way that it's working in a healthy, in a healthier manner, right? So um, I, then when I was thinking about your question, you know, how does this forge a new social contract I jotted down uh, just a few um, a few points, and I agree with Bill. Uh, we have always aspired to having a well-run economy that provides good employment opportunities for all by whatever means possible whether they're in the public sector, whether it is requiring the private sector to do better, whether it is enhancing social services that are neglected, but the public option for jobs has been missing, right? That is another mechanism that is missing. And so in, in a way, we would like a well, um, uh, oil, you know, well-run economy that provides economic opportunity, climbing, you know, ladders, if you will, but we have to start somewhere. There has to be a basic standard. And so when I think about the social contract, I think of it this way. Um, number one, a new social contract is one that says we will not inflict the injury of unemployment on people. As a policy commitment, we will guarantee employment opportunities, basic living wage employment opportunities. So our macro thinking then becomes from the bottom up. It happens from through direct employment um, at base wage, you know, the price anchor for all wages and prices in the economy. That's the macro commitment, but it is um, a kind of a new, a new social contract responding to ups and downs of economic fluctuations. Number two, um, this would be familiar to those who have studied MMT. The social contract says that we will remedy the problem that we have created. In the monetary system, the tax and non-reciprocal obligations create the inevitable unemployment, somebody seeking work in the monetary unit. And it is only the issuer of that unit that can remedy that condition. And so if we have... Um, this kind of injury, the original sin of our monetary system is unemployment, then the social contract says that it is the public sector that will, will, will remedy that, that problem that it creates. So it's really a right. To me, actually, the rights framework is very important because it is the right of the people to demand the employment of, of, the, of the source that creates the unemployment. Okay, number three. No working person shall fall below um, basic dignified wage benefit package. So while we would not want the job guarantee to do, and I, I always say, you know, there are far too great expectations of the job guarantee. <laughs> you shouldn't expect the job guarantee to solve all your social problems. Um, it, you know, it should be small, it should be there, but it has to be the standard that says, this will be the dignified wage benefit for. This is what every other um, uh, firm must match, and thus it becomes the labor standard. So that's a new component to the social contract. Um, number four, the government safety net. It's you know, maybe a subset. We always have income support and various training opportunities for jobs that are not there, but the safety net will, be, will have the missing piece of the direct employment. Um, number five, you know, we often talk about the job guarantee fitting the job to the worker, right? That there are, um, we want to enable people to be successful, to be able to transition into employment, to transition to better paid employment, to provide these opportunities. So you see the paradigm is flipped, where in, you know, in the traditional sense, people are fitted to particular jobs. Here, we're creating employment opportunities where they can, you know, get on the job training to be successful, et cetera. So it flips, we value people, not jobs, right? Number six, um, the jobs in the public sector 
don't yield these are public service jobs right they don't they're not created for commercial return they're not created for profit they're created for all of the reasons that we just articulated that does not mean that they cannot deliver social value and indeed they must right you, you know we are also talking about doing things that they are just not traditionally done and i think this is why the link between the job guarantee and the environmental concerns is just so strong because they're often the last ones on the ladder neglected and they cannot be remedied with a job guarantee. I want to be very clear about this, that the environmental concerns require multi-pronged strategy. But when you talk about a job that would be for basic maintenance of our natural environment, that is almost the most basic form of labor that we can do um, to, to sustain, you know, our uh, our world if you will so we value what is typically undervalued a few more a few more angles um, that i want to highlight number seven going back to the macro we reject the necessity of unemployment right all these things that bill was referring to that you know the trade-off that was formalized in the 50s in the 60s now it's called the naira this constant refrain that we need unemployment for price stability that is a new social contract we reject that we argue that unemployment or poorly paid employment will not be used as inflation bulwark. We will find other mechanism of addressing inflation. Job guarantee is one. Of course, there are other sources of inflation. You know, uh, there are other policies, but it's not going to be people in poverty. Number eight, um, you know, once we reject the threat of unemployment, that has ripple effects for people who are not unemployed. Right? It improves their own well-being. Um, that you may have a job, but you're constantly afraid. You know, you tolerate discrimination, you tolerate other things, and those things happen at the lower end of the income distribution a lot more. And so having the out, having the option is a new social contract. Um, finally, we, we now we don't have to talk about the inevitable trade-offs between jobs and environment, jobs and technology, jobs and you name it. Jobs are always the trade-off of anything, right? <laughs> so we reject that narrative. So that's another component of the, of the job guarantee. And finally, um, as I argued, this, this has to do with design. Like, you know, taking into account all the macro features. Once you think about how you put it in place on the ground, you know, my um, uh, emphasis has always been on the bottom up participatory design where you involve the people in the community in the design of the projects, which means that we enhance participatory democracy. We enhance input of the very people whose livelihoods are being impacted, of our communities. And so we now try to mobilize all corners of civil society for this new social contract and this new way um, of, of being and living and working. And the very, very last point that I'm going to say, that I'm going to point out is that this is not a nation-specific policy. You know, the, the, the ideal commitment would be to have a global commitment to full employment, where now, you know, globe, we, we foster global labor solidarity, right? People, you know, jobs are not, again, pitted against each other in the, in the competition for trade. And thus, we then articulate and we, um, uh, we uh, meet the challenge that was laid out very early in the turn of last century. Right, that you know, from the ILO to the ITO to the UN, um, that there has been an international articulation for the importance of guaranteeing the right, you know, employment and full employment. And so, um, the job guarantee can be that tool for social, macroeconomic, and global uh, integration. Thank you. Thank you. So, Anne, I might um, hand it over to you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you to Bill and Pavlina for your comments that have got everyone thinking. <laughs> um, so while Marcus is just collating those questions, um, maybe I'll get the ball rolling with just a first one to uh, both of you, maybe beginning with Bill. Just in this, in this idea that we're talking now about the job guarantee, so maybe we could be a little bit more explicit about how we talk about the job guarantee. Um, you know, the way I've started to think about it myself is this idea that the job guarantee is like this um, necessary but not sufficient sort of aspect of, 
you know, if we're calling it renewing the social contract. Um, and Bill, you even uh, got me thinking with your blog post relating today's, to today's discussion, where you said that um, pouring, pouring all our activist and political energy into getting a job guarantee up is not a sensible strategy. So, of course, that makes the uh, activist in me sit back and think, well, um, we seem to be in this conundrum, I think, which is where the job guarantee on the surface, it seems like a very simple concept. You know, it's obviously a job creation program, but it gets a little bit more complex when we think about the macroeconomics and the way, uh, you know, you describe it as a price stability framework. And I think that's the harder thing for people to get their heads around. And I've even heard proponents of the job guarantee as well as the detractors, you know, just say, well, all this talk about price stability, that's just economic techno babble. <laughs> so I was just wondering if... Um, Perhaps you could talk more about what is the significance of the job uh, in its function as a price stability framework. Um, and even if you would like to unpack some of those more uh, difficult to understand concepts like automatic stabilising and price anchoring, because um, I think our audience is probably already very sympathetic to the idea, but I feel like we need ways of getting this over to people without um, making the job guarantee also like the the centre point for if we are looking for a, a new so social contract or if we are looking at um, act, being active around moving the economy out of, a, say, a fossil fuel-driven economy and looking at what the just transition or the green transition might look like. So if you, either of you have any comments about how to talk about the job guarantee, but might start with you, Bill. Well, look, I thought, <clears throat> I thought Pavlina's 10-point plan or 10-point definition was very elegant. And I think that, uh, you know, when I grew up, we had a right to public education. We knew that everybody had a right to state-delivered public education. We knew that every citizen, we grew up as children knowing that everybody could have public health care. If they were sick and very sick, they'd go to a hospital without, and they wouldn't become poor as a consequence. We, we knew that we had lots of protections under rule of law as principles of a, of a civil society. And the other thing that when I was young, because it was a full employment era, we knew that we could always have a right to a job. As a young person uh, through school, you knew that there was always a job, even at the minimal, at the lowest level of pay, you could always get a job. So you didn't think about that. I always knew that I could get a job when I wanted one. And so my thoughts were on, well, what am I going to do with myself? And what am I going to, you know, do I want to pursue a trade and become a carpenter or a, a plumber or do I want to go in, pursue higher education, whether do I want to go to tech school and become a drafts person or something or do I want to go to university and become something else? These were the ways we thought because we knew we could always get a job no matter what. So, so there was no issue worrying the angst of whether I was going to be unemployed or not. So your life's dreams become, what am I going to do with myself? What opportunities can, can I pursue according to my preferences and my assessment of what I can do? And that way of thinking was driven by the full employment guarantee that we had when in the full employment era and it's a fundamental shift in, in 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 a young person's dreaming about their future than we have now and so the way i think of a job guarantee is that it's it's like having a right to an education or a right to public health 
or a right to to being respected under the law. It's just one of the rights of a sophisticated, civilised society that then frees you from the anxieties, in this case of unemployment and, and, and poverty. So if we all grow up thinking there's, there's at least a job there that I can do and I can select my hours, I can get trained within it, it's going to give me a socially inclusive wage that means that I can go to the football on a Saturday or go to, the, go to a restaurant or have a bit of a holiday uh, so I can be included in society. It's the minimum conditions required for that inclusiveness. It will give me four weeks holiday pay in the Australian settings. If I get sick, it will give me whatever 14 days sick pay a year. It will contribute to my superannuation fund so that I can expect a, a moderate ret material retirement, but at least a secure retirement. Then I'm freed. I can think big, knowing that at least... I've got security in society. That's the way I think of a job guarantee. Mm -hmm. That's a very inspiring way, I think, to talk about it. And um, so what you're talking about is how if you frame it in the rights framework, that actually translates into the way individuals can dream big. And I think it help, really helps to have an historic um, memory about how things used to be different and therefore taking the best of the past and projecting it into the future. So I'm wondering, Pavlina, if you had any comments about that. Yeah, thank you. I want to talk maybe a little bit about um, the question of how do we, you know, get over to, you know, having people recognize the benefits of the job guarantee. And I think at least, at least um, in the recent years, we have polled the program and it does poll very well. It, it really, and actually we haven't, we've been polling it since the late eighties in the United States. There are various surveys, but in like the, it has entered the popular discourse, at least in the United States and the UK was polled. And so um, people do like it. It is quite possible that people don't fully appreciate what it is, that it may be that they like it for the job creation aspect. That there is just so much anxiety and the loss of jobs. But nevertheless, it is overwhelmingly popular. And it is it does garner bipartisan support. I mean, in the US, it's upwards of 70%, similar survey in the UK, etc. Um, and so I think uh, this is a good thing. It's it, it's a it's a good thing, and all aspects of the job guarantee need to be highlighted. I think that if we are to have an enduring success, I think we need to appreciate the macroeconomic uh, aspects of it. Okay, because um, it is it's these sorts of wranglings that um, that were you know, problematic during the New Deal, you know, well, which is a real job and which is not a real job, you know, will unions support it or not support it? You know, what's considered low skill versus high skilled work? You know, what are, on which premises is the job offer made, right? What is the program supposed to do and supposed to serve? If the program is supposed to serve all of the neglected areas in public sector life, as I said, it's a Sisyphean task. We shouldn't ask so much of the job guarantee. What we need to do is, uh, fortify our public services, whichever way we need them on ongoing permanent basis and still recognize that people are the collateral damage of an economy that has a heartbeat. And we just have to reject that. And we need to say very firmly that that will not be an acceptable condition, that we will provide the dignified basic job offer. So we think it is important to articulate the macroeconomic benefits, but we should also embrace very much the democratizing potential of it and the other aspirational aspects that it is possible that our community will have community gardens and they will be, yes, staffed by job guarantee workers, but they will be there as permanent infrastructure. And job guarantee workers will come and go, but we will have those um, public services that might be missing, that we will have an ongoing army of tree planters or people that will be doing remediation that's invisible, but it has to be done. And so that's why I highlight that green jobs are very, um, really good for this kind of work because they certainly can be expanded very quickly. They can certainly be delayed. They are permanent. There's a permanent need for their, for their work. So the way you think of it 
is we think of the permanent programs, not necessarily permanent employment. And some of the employment will be permanent, but some of it will come and go, right? On the job training, young people will need apprenticeships, et cetera. So, so um, we are trying, I think what we're to articulate is a permanent fiscal infrastructure as a macroeconomic response. And then on the ground, um, sites, locations of job offers that will be able to deal with either larger influx or lower influx. But I, I do want to say this, this is a huge misconception about the job guarantee, that somehow it will have to fluctuate in these dramatic ways as unemployment fluctuates. Once you have a full employment economy, all matter of employment is more stabilized. It's private sector, it's public sector. Like the, and we've seen this historically in the data, full employment economies do not go through the yo-yo avalanche effect of unemployment. So the task is so much easier. That's really useful, actually, to help people start imagining what a full employment world would look like. Because if you haven't lived through it, it's very hard to imagine, therefore, how would a job guarantee look like or how would a fully functioning public service look like? And I really liked your um, comment earlier about rejecting that narrative about the trade-off between jobs and environment or, um, you know, jobs and something else. And I think it's that whole reframing that we're all doing as we talk about the job guarantee. So unless you, either of you have any more comments, I might throw over to... Uh, Marcus, who will have some questions from our audience today. Brilliant. Thanks, Anne. Um, so the first one, we've actually had two questions coming in uh, uh, around steady state. So can Australia move to a steady state economy and potentially what has a job guarantee role in that? And just before answering that, I'm not 100% sure what is meant by steady state. Wayne, did you want to say any comments on that one? Thank you, Marcus. Uh, a steady state economy um, a la um, Herman Daly. I'm sure that Bill and um, Pavlina are aware of Herman Daly's work. We aspire to a steady state economy in, the, in that context. So when we talked about full employment, say, in the 1960s, the, the one, the, there were several elements of a steady state economy that we, we ignored because we were ignorant. And uh, in 2021, we add more elements to what we mean by a steady state. A steady state is that everybody who wants a job can find one. Everybody who wants some working hours can find them. And, of course, all activities have to be consistent with maintaining our natural environmental health as much as we worry about our own physical health, but we've also got to worry about that, obviously. We're embedded in the planet. The planet isn't just another resource that we can use to fix the economy, to make the economy work. The economy works for us and the planet. And that's what a steady state has to be. So job guarantee, that doesn't alter the fact that in a steady state, people want to work and have to work. I mean, from the from the day one of humanity, we've been transforming nature. That's the only way we survived. And the the the, the way in which we transform nature has to evolve. And and in this current era, it has to evolve very quickly, and uh, away from the the damaging transformations, the the catastrophic terminal transformation so it, that doesn't alter the need for a buffer stock of jobs uh, that is of always available to anybody who wants to work and and I, I think Pavlina's point was fantastic that you know I see on the on Twitter people thinking the job guarantee is going to become 40 percent of the workforce or something that we're going to have hordes of people on minimum wages. In a properly run economy would have a job guarantee very, very small. When we had true full employment in Australia, we might have had half a percent of the workforce, half a percent, if that, in these jobs I talked about within the public sector that you could always get, a tiny little number of people. They were very important people because they were people. 
but it was a very small thing, and that's because the government pr had plenty of other jobs for people. Brilliant. Thank, thanks for that, Bill. Um, Pavlina, did you want to add anything to that, or I'll move on to the next one? I, I think Bill put it perfectly well. There are Brilliant. environmental limits. We will have to live within these environmental limits. But as long as this economy that operates within these environmental limits goes through ups and downs, the job guarantee has to be a key component of how we reach the steady state. There are many other, you know, things we need to be thinking about of how to maintain a, you know, you know not pillage the environment, etc. But um, yeah, I think that that's right. Brilliant. Thank you, Pavlina. So a question that's related to that is around the role, I suppose, of what a job guarantee can have for mental health. So there's been a few questions around, um, so for example, uh, I do appreciate your work addressing negative mental health effects of unemployment. How far do you think the job guarantee will go into solving these sorts of um, mental health crises in the Western world? Uh, Pavlina, perhaps if you could start with that one. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to uh, overpromise. You know, I think this is important. You know, mental health is a complicated issue. You know, and and there it's a compounded issue, right? By a multitude of um, individual and social factors. But what we want to do is we want to remove this one critical determinant of mental health, social determinant of mental health. And we do not want the distress of absence of a job to be a source of uh, mental health problems. Um, you know, housing could be an issue. You could be, you could have a job, but not have a home. And that would also be contributing to some of these um, other costs. So I think we need to think of it more holistically but what we know is that when jobs rob a community of its economic life, these effects become compounded and they also accelerate. And so it's the job is just seems to be linked to all sorts of social deprivations. It's not going to solve them all, but we just want to remove it as a critical uh, factor. Yeah, so, so two, three observations. One, when I described those jobs that anybody could get in the 1960s and 70s in the public sector, um, I used to be able. I was. I used to be able to get a job on down at the Victoria at Spencer Street in Melbourne rail yards on any day of the week I wanted, and and that gave us a chance to have a little bit of income uh, at a time uh, at in a difficult period, and my workmates would disappear on, a, on some days. Some days they'd be there, some days they wouldn't be there, and they were people with episodic illnesses. But they could always go down to the Spencer Street rail yards and load trucks when they were feeling a bit better. And we also know, second point, we also know that one of the pathologies that arise from unemployment is the deprivation of social contact and the feeling of shame and the loss of your social network the social network narrows until you're sitting at home on your own feeling depressed and failed. And that contributes to a rapid incidence in, in mental uh, illness. The third thing I'd say is relates to my own personal experience. One of my large Australian Research Council grants that I've had in the past was to work with the, the uh, um, New South Wales Health Department as a as one of the link as linkage partnership, and this was the James Fletcher Hospital Group that that are the uh, leading researchers and practitioners in dealing with youth with psychosis, and that partnership. What what we did was we worked with the the, the clinical professionals over a three year period, and the problem of young people is they 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 become schizophrenic typically in their towards the end of their secondary school. And um, uh, that completely disrupts their life because they often can't finish secondary school. They often can't go on to university or other training, other technical or, or skill development, and they can't get jobs. And so their life spirals out of control. And all the research evidence shows that early intervention into that problem, which is a very significant problem for, for young people, uh, early early intervention can stop their adult lives being totally dysfunctional and unbelievably depressing. And so our project was to design, design job structures and find employers 
that would hire these young young men and women, and uh, and we and the clinical team su- designed clinical support structures uh, that could uh, help help those young people when they were having problems. And uh, what we found was the following. Private sector employers wouldn't participate, wouldn't have a bar of it. So we found some employers that would participate. And the we also found that uh, one of the problems of, of young people with mental illness going into the workplace was not their own problem, but the perception of the other workers in the workplace who were, fear, you know, elementary concerns like, are these people going to get an axe and freak out and, and axe us to death and stuff like this? And so we also designed an education program that could help the non-mentally ill workers participate with young people who who did have episodic illnesses and sometimes were just dysfunctional. And what we found, to cut a long story short, was that those young people, their, their life's experiences improved dramatically. They were very functional. They were very productive. But some days they weren't because they were ill and they got adequate clinical support. And we could read, we could design the work processes to be flexible to, to accommodate them. And, and what, we, what I learned from that was that job creation programs like that at, at an elemental level can give um, people with those mental problems a much better life. And what we also, what, what's the evidence of longer term studies have observed is that the, the, the incidence of, of symptom declines as the, as the self-esteem rises. So that even though they've still got schizophrenia, the dramatic, the, the devastating consequences of that decline and they become functional adults. They have, they suddenly, these young people suddenly had relationships for the first time with, with girls or boys, you know, partnerships. They were able to manage their lives better. It's, it's a no-brainer. And, and, and only a, a public sector type structure can be that flexible. You need flexibility and you need to value. And I thought what Pavlina said about it's it's the people we care about, not it's the, the jobs have to be be tailored to the people. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate that. So the next question is actually sort of uh, extends on from that discussion around the role of jobs guarantee uh, from a mental health or society improvement perspective. Uh, and a lot of people have commented having challenges around, well, what sort of jobs does a job guarantee fulfill or entail? Uh, so there's a, a couple of questions here around you know, what sort of jobs could the job guarantee cover? Uh, Pavlina, would you mind kicking off on that one? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, as we discussed earlier, in um, the environmental concerns of many, they are uh, ongoing, and there isn't, you know, there isn't a kind of a commercial return and incentive for the private sector to do. But that's not even um, the proper way to think about it. There's so many things that the private sector doesn't have an incentive to do, <laughs> and so this is a proper function of the public sector. So what what we're really thinking about is a structure by which when somebody goes to the unemployment office, they can walk out with a job offer. We can deploy existing infrastructure to provide them those opportunities, right? So they may be green rehabilitation projects. As I said, these are um, very open to expanding and to um, contracting. But, you know, there are also ongoing threats you know, we, we have fires, we have floods, we have ongoing devastation that has to be cleaned up. Um, so you will need to have a permanent body that deals with these, but that would be very suitable to providing job employment opportunities for people who have been um, unemployed for one reason or another. You know, I, I um, think of kind of a symbiosis between the ongoing public sector work that needs to be done 
with the job guarantee? What, what are our aspirations? We want to give a people a step up, right? A leg up with opportunities. So having, you know, on the job training opportunities, whether it is in school settings, whether it is in hospital settings that are kind of on the job training programs, essentially. Um, and then of course there will be, um, you know, folks who the private sector will not be able to employ that that will become the permanent employment opportunity. So I think that, you know, the basic criteria is a public service um, employment opportunity that is uh, ongoing and, you know, could be community gardens, could be after scare, uh, aftercare school activities. I mean, in the United States, the context is very peculiar. A lot of these things are done on voluntary basis. There are so many um, after school programs that are, you know, understaffed because they wait for volunteers to come in and, and do them. And we can certainly use that infrastructure. The, the community groups are already there, right? They're just struggling. We can certainly use that infrastructure um, to uh, put some, you know, some folks to, to work. So I would say I, I speak of care work, care for the environment, care for the community, care for people, right? Meals on wheels, etc. With an understanding that there are that these these it's not the project that needs to come and go. It's the person that needs to be enabled to come into the project and then move out as they need. You know, I can I just say one more thing. Very often when I'm asked this question, um, I wonder if there is like an underlying assumption that it the justification for the job guarantee is the kind of project that is going to be done. I, I you, it may not have been intended in this particular question, but I do find this quite often, but wait a minute, what kind of jobs will they be? And I think it's important to think about this again from a macro perspective. The litmus test is not the project. The litmus test is that we're eradicating an employment, right? Because it becomes the same thing. What's more important, the person or the job, right? So, so the person or the project. And so, of course, we want to have meaningful public service employment opportunities, and there are many areas of need that are unfilled. But the litmus test is the benefits on the individual and the benefits on the macroeconomy from having this kind of policy paradigm shift. Thank you very much, Pavlina. Um, I've, we have a, a question that came in during the week uh, around the, uh, and I have had a lot of discussion around this point, job guarantee versus basic income versus UBI. Um, and the question is, I hear people who are pro job guarantee say they also think it would be incompatible with a basic income. That is a job guarantee could sit alongside an income for those who choose not to work. Um, could the panel provide some views on this and Bill if we don't mind we could start with you on this one well I don't really want to but <laughs> yeah, I, I know I know but I think this has been done to death and I'm sick to death of it myself and I'm I, I just think it's it's become an incredibly ignorant debate and I'm sorry for saying that I think it's just a destructive debate that a few people with 15 Twitter followers have amplified it to ridiculous proportions you, the job guarantee can be compatible with almost anything. Let's say that for the start. So in the Australian context, sure, you could maintain the current pernicious, vicious, cruel, torturing unemployment benefit system if you want to, and that's what a lot of progressives seem to say they want, and, and have a job guarantee. The, and the idea that job guarantee would be mandatory is just false. I've never said that in my life. Job guarantee is voluntary. You, 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 if you want a job, you can have it. It's unconditional. It's demand-driven. It's not a slave can. It's not workfare. It's totally voluntary. And so it can be. You could run an unemployment benefit system as well. But if you eliminate unemployment, why do you need an unemployment benefit system? You don't, obviously. So then what you're really talking about is a basic income system. Now, then, then, you say to, then I say to people, okay, well, if you understand the genesis of the job guarantee as a price stabilisation framework and you want to have a basic income program, well, then effectively you're maintaining a system where the government pays everything at market prices whether it does it for its own procurement or whether it gives it to people as basic income and they compete at market prices, spend at market prices. 
It's okay, you can do that. But then what happens when capitalism has an inflationary crisis and the government needs to tighten spending because that's, that's indicated, then your basic income model becomes a Nehru model. You're really still going to use unemployment and the perniciousness of that to stabilise your, your distributional conflict. I reject that outright. If we then go on and say, well, what else will, can we say about this? Well, then go back to what I said right at the beginning today of, of collective will. I believe in society. I believe that we've all got a role to play to benefit each other as best we can and we should respect everybody's contribution at all times. Everybody can contribute. I don't really want to live in a society where people think they're so privileged that they can extract income for nothing and not give back. That's just a moral, ethical position for me as a left-wing socialist. I want everybody to contribute in, in whatever way they can and I want everybody to have the opportunity to do that. And if you can't contribute through work because you're old or sick or young, then we look after you. That's the nature of society. But if you're able and, I, and to contribute, I believe you should. And if we eliminate unemployment, there's no, no need for unemployment benefits. And I challenge people who's, who, who, who make these views that they are quite happy in a progressive society having people who can contribute not then create a private welfare organisation and pay incomes. And I, bet, I guarantee you that the voices that are loudest out there on social media will not create a private welfare organisation and contribute. And I just reject that argument that, oh, we can just be left alone to do our art. Well, someone's got to clean the streets and stop infection. Someone's got to make the food that you buy at the supermarket, someone's got to do all of those things. So you're not escaping capitalism. You're not escaping material world and the market. You're just pushing those responsibilities onto other people. And then I could go on for hours about the, the work I've done with psychologists and how, how social networks shrink and, and it's not a viable solution to have people not engaged in society. But I won't. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, Bill. And look, as a um, behavioural scientist myself, your point on the psychological benefits of work are very valid and decades, decades, of re 100 years of research has shown that. Um, thank you for your response. Uh, Pavlina, did you want to add anything to that one? I just, I agree with Bill. This conversation is totally argued on the wrong premises. And a lot of it is driven by extremely narrow conceptions of work. Not only the mischaracterization, the job guarantee, um, tends to enjoy out there that it's a work fair, it's a guarantee, it's not an obligation. So we could repeat it one more time. But also it's a very narrow conception of work. Like what does it mean to, to work? I, you know, a lot of people still have this, you know, they're not able to emancipate themselves of, of the, the um, of the current constraint. You know, they see work as always and everywhere punitive. But once you think of it as participatory, right, we would like, we, should, we don't believe that there should be starving artists musicians, right? So in the modern context, you know, a lot of people say, well, I just want my UBI so I can, you know, go and pursue my artistic interests. Well, who said we won't value that? In, in fact, the job guarantee precisely recognizes this, that we want to value um, um, the many contributions that, that people um, can make. So um, I'm gonna just put it, put it there that there is a literature on participation income that I think is, is the place where these two dialogues can merge. Um, I do agree that you know, this idea that UBI is sufficient to satisfy our needs is completely uh, incorrect on not just on moral grounds that uh, Bill articulated, but also on economic grounds. You just don't understand how the economy works. And if you think that just income is enough <laughs> to create that well-being, then <laughs> it's sorely mistaken. And number two, I think people understand this. I, I, there are loud voices, but people do understand this. In the polls, the job guarantee always comes on top. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in around the how to determine the level of wages for a job guarantee program. Um, and, and Bill, I know you've 
address this on your blog actually quite extensively. Uh, so I actually, in terms of Australian context, I think I would direct people to Bill's blog around that. But Pavlina, perhaps from uh, the US perspective or outside of Australia, if you could make some comments around um, you know, how to determine the level of wa living wages of the Job Guarantee Program, um, and as part of that, if the minimum wage rate in the private sector is not yet adequate, can the wage level in the Job Guarantee Program be set above the private sector minimum wage? Yes, it can, and um, it will it will work better, of course, if you have um, combined legislation with the increase in the minimum wage. It would make it easier um, and less disruptive. But uh, you know, right now in the United States, we have this huge debate whether we should increase the minimum wage from seven twenty-five to fifteen dollars an hour, you know, doubling it essentially. And we haven't increased the minimum wage since two thousand and nine. It's long overdue. It is really low low wage people cannot live on that wage and we have a large proportion of the population that that works below 15 42 percent so as we were discussing earlier you know these um you know these are empirical questions on the potentially disruptive effect on the minimum wage and um the best way for me to go forward is to first mandate a nationwide increase in the minimum wage so that the private firms are forced to meet that standard but in the depths of a recession, if you have some small businesses and they try, have to double up their, you know, double their wage bill, you may have some, on a, you know, some layoffs. But that's why we have the job guarantee. You know, we no longer have to make that choice. We actually can affirm that there will be a basic standard at 15 and then we will deal with the residual unemployment. Um, you know, as I said, these are probably more empirical questions in terms of how you phase in um, this, uh, this uh, minimum wage. But we see that states do this. They do it. Washington increased their minimum wage to 15. There are various other states who are moving above the minimum in the um, in the United States. Uh, Bernie Sanders shamed Amazon into raising their wage to 15 a couple of years ago. It's not hard. It can be done. Um, but all these anxieties can be alleviated with with the job guarantee. And I think you know we keep saying that this is this is a feature of the program. You do want to provide the competition that private firms don't have uh, on matching that wage, right? Um, and so um, what is the living wage? I think we agree that we want to have a stable nationwide, there's a de democratizing kind of potential of having like a, a minimum wage just as it is set na nationwide. Um, and then you can allow, as it is today, uh, states or municipalities to have their own living wage ordinances and do a top up uh, of the, the base wage from the job guarantee. Yeah, I think the general principles that I've always articulated and I've done work for the International Labor Organization and South African government in this context, designing their minimum wage system that they currently use, is that the first principle is that the minimum wage cannot be a capacity to pay concept. So I do a lot of work in the in the industrial courts here for trade unions and that, and it's always coming up the capacity to pay principle. Now, if you def what a minimum wage is is the is the minimum material standard you're you're willing to accept as a society. That's what it is, and uh, it can't be a capacity to pay because then you can have all high cost, low productivity firms saying, well, we can't pay it. Well, then, then, you say, you, then you have to say to those firms, buzz off. This came up in the South African experience where a lot of firms were below what was, what was going, were paying below what could possibly socially inclusive minimum level of wage payments. And the, and the IMF said to me, oh, well, all these firms couldn't afford to pay. I say, okay, but that's not South Africa's future, those firms. And so there's a transition plan you've got to come up with. But if you aspire to be a sophisticated society, then the minimum wage has to express the minimum of that. And, and it doesn't take too many nutritionists and psychologists and sociologists on a panel to work out what the dollar figure for that would be. It's not rocket science. Thanks for that, Bill. Um, look, I am conscious of time, so I think um, there is one more question which I, I think will be fairly quick, but it's an interesting one uh, associated with the education of, of MMT. Um, and someone said, uh, I've, I've used, this is from David Parker uh, from Seattle, uh, 
to family and friends, he's used the uh, example of Monopoly, the game of Monopoly. And the banker has to go first to giving people currency, not by tax and money we don't have. Um, and the Monopoly sort of metaphor has been used a number of different times. Could you briefly, um, as a comment, say, you know, is that a good example? Do you find that works? I'll be brief. Pavlina can be longer. It does. To me, I don't like it because it's about rentier capitalism and about uh, rich bastards driving out poor people in in uh, Old Kent Road and uh, uh, Euston and Pentonville out of their homes into destitution. I hate hate the analogy, even though I understand it. Thanks, Bill. Pavlina? <laughs> I don't have this uh, these strong feelings. I play Monopoly with my kid, but we do talk about capitalism still. Um, <laughs> it's you know, we, you know, it's a it, it's a device. You know, where does the money come from? I think as long as it does drives the point that somebody gets it, that it's not, you know, the money in your pockets comes from one place only. The currency, rather, comes from one place only. I think we're you know a step ahead. Yeah, look, thank you for that. And I think the broader question that's also been touched on by a number of people is around, you know, turning this this no, new knowledge that MMT brings and, and trying to uh, influence the public discourse and ultimately policy change. Uh, and whether you use uh, you know, metaphors of some kind, monopoly or whatever, you know, it's all wrapped around that idea of uh, how do we get the message out? How do we influence change? Um, and perhaps as a final comment around that, because uh, we do need to wrap up. Uh, Bill, I know you've um, spoken a lot of, around this and you've, you've even done webinars and, and um, courses around you know, uh, train the trainer, so to speak, and, and how to affect the public discourse. As a final comment, uh, Bill or Pavlina, perhaps Bill, you won't go first, what sort of comments you might want to make around what, what do we do next? Where do we go from here? Yeah, you know, I think that over time I've, I've learned I've learned to understand that being clever about economics is not sufficient, that we can bat on all day about where do we get the currency from and all the rest of the technical things that now define MMT, but it's, it's a psychological challenge we're up against as well. And this is where the sort of stuff on framing and language matters. And that's why in the last seven or eight years I've moved into that area as well with Louisa Connors, who's, that's her area. And it's really important that it's a double challenge to reframe people's thinking because if we, if we don't do that, then what, when I say something as a, as a, in an economic sense, it just gets reframed back into the mainstream cognition and, and I think the lesson from the social psychologists and the cognitive linguists is very clear that unless you reframe and make that your priority, then you can be as smart as you like on the MMT concepts you won't get through. And that's our challenge. It's an unbelievably difficult challenge. But relentlessness is necessary. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Pavlina. No, I absolutely agree with uh, with Bill, and I think I would also add one other challenge that we all actually don't have the luxury of time. We don't have the luxury of time of people, you know, adopting and understanding a new paradigm and us finding the way to communicate it. And so we are really running a kind of an unfair race. And in that race, I feel that you got to get all the help that you can get. And one way to do this is to perhaps help how others um, who are working on their specific issues can connect to your own work. So, you know, you know broadly coalition building, but how the goal of securing full employment um, also connects to the goal of housing um, and the various other kind of social deprivations and everything is connected to everything. So the more that we can articulate those linkage, linkages, I think um, the better off we are uh, we probably are not going to get the version of the job guarantee that we we, we think we're going to get. Um, we're going to try, right? We're going to work hard at it. But you, we also have to solve some very important problems. <laughs> so 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, both of you. And I think um, we'll end the question session there and I'll hand it back to Anne and Jane. I really appreciate your um, generosity with your time and your expertise. And I um, always enjoy these sessions. They're hard work, but the MMT pennies are always dropping and I always benefit from further discussion and delving deep into the issues and hearing issues over and over again. And I just wanted to say, um, Bill, uh, I, without embarrassing you or appearing fawning over you, I think you're a national treasurer and I hope people learn to um, appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, I'm impatient for change and I know that we don't have the luxury of time and, um, and I really hope we as an organisation can have a little bit of a, an impact on spreading the word and um, changing people's minds. And Pavlina, I really have been um, following your work for a long time and I very much appreciate the metaphors that you use in public, the public health metaphors. And I think for me, prevention and preparedness really does boil it down to the approach down to what it really is about is like um, preventing all of those social ills that come about naturally from a, a capitalist system that's unchecked and preparing for those that may come in the future. I just wanted to also say that your tribute in the front of the book to your daughter, Yvette, and I think, you know, that's a tribute for everyone, really, that may we live in a world that is green and just. And so I think ending on that <laughs> would be quite a nice um, message to finish off this, the webinar. So thank you. And Anne. Uh, well, thank you, Jane. Yes, just to echo all those sentiments and to thank our speakers very much for their time today, because I know they are both in demand because it is such a pertinent issue at the moment and Bill I loved your image of the glowing embers of collective will which may be fanning into flames and I just uh, remind you to uh, if you want to watch this one again this episode again this webinar again you can go to our YouTube channel which I think is on our website look out for that one okay thank you thank you for that bye-bye see you later bye. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.